Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm excited to be joined by not one, not two, not three, but four guests for this uh, Cygnus Alpha Down and Safe chat. Now, did Blake 7 finish in 1981? Or does it carry on today? We all know the answer, of course. It's still carrying on, thanks to these guys. So would you all like to please introduce yourselves and say what you have been doing over the last few years for Blake 7? Well, I'm John Ainsworth. I'm the, I have been the producer of Blake 7 for Big Finish for the last, what, two, three years? Um, I worked out, I must have looked after about 40 hours worth of episodes. Of course, it had a history a big finish before I took over, so there's even more of it than, 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 than I've looked after. But that's what I've been doing. Let's go to Hello, you. I'm Mark Wright. Uh, I've been writing a lot of Blake 7 for Big Finish over the years, going back to the beginning of the, the Breaks Chronicles and the full cast. So I wrote the 40th anniversary adventure, The Way Ahead, um, and uh, various other bits and pieces that John kindly asked me to do. I am Trevor Baxendale. I've been writing Blake 7 for Big Finish uh, for a few years now, occasional episodes, and uh, I think one novel and one audio novel. Okay, uh, Steve. Yeah, I'm Steve Lyons, and again, been writing Blake Seven since I'm not sure when it was, but it, uh, like Mark, it was one of the early Liberator Chronicles, um, and I've done quite a few of the, the recent full cast adventures. Are you all surprised by how popular the, the, the whole uh, Blake Seven range has been for Big Finish? No. <laughs> yes, it's brilliant. Yeah, really good. Surprised is relieved. <laughs> yes. I think we all love Blake Seven, so you know it's hard to imagine why people wouldn't. So I think it, it, it was always for me. It was always side by side with Doctor Who was something that you know I loved and that I knew had a big following. So you know when when Big Finish started doing them, it just it just felt like well, it's about time. Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, the, the nicest thing to hear from people who've heard, certainly the ones that I've been doing, is that they've said what we actually intended to do, which was to be as authentic to the TV series as possible. <laughs> certainly the recent uh, Crossfire and the um, Restoration series were deliberately meant to fit into the end of season three, and, and that seems to have been quite successful. I think people have liked that. Mm -hmm. And has it has it been easy to identify those those gaps where you can put things in? Because you're quite limited in a way. You know, there's only the four series. You can't. I still don't understand why season four can't be used. Um, maybe you could explain, John. Yeah, well, season it's it, it's not impossible to do season four. It just would become more costly and more difficult. It's because it's a rights issue, basically. Mm -hmm. that Big Finish's rights to do Blake 7 are with the Tone Nation estate. Right. An additional little license to use photography and the logo and the theme tune. But we don't really have a direct license with the BBC for the actual sort of stories and characters. Mm -hmm. So we've been able to use the format as yes. created by Tone Nation and the characters created by Tone Nation, and that includes any characters from any episodes that he wrote. Mm -hmm. He didn't have anything to do with season four uh, in terms of the format. So Scorpio and Sue in particular belong to the BBC because although Chris Patrick created them, he created them as a staff member. So that means it's the BBC that owns, owns it, not Chris Boucher. Mm -hmm. Then we could get a licence from the BBC to do season four, but we would still have to have a licence for donation as well. So it would just increase the cost uh, uh, you know, more than it is. And, you know, there is a limit to the budget that we can, uh, yeah. that we're allowed to spend. So that's the main reason we have to run it. Having said that, in fairness, I haven't helped you because I thought we had a very good sort of format. You know, the, you were saying about how many gaps. We've actually had one gap since I uh, came along, which is between the parts of the episode of season three and the final one. Mm -hmm. And everything has been put in that gap. So, which is years long as far as it is. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, season three takes about 10 years, I think. As, <laughs> how I it. There's a lot of time you can crowbar in there, I think. Absolutely. Um, it, actually, um, Mark, let's talk about you finding oh. gaps. I mean, for the 40th um, anniversary, I mean, oh my God, I love it. I absolutely <laughs> love you. this one. 
I mean, just you finding those little things and also the clever bit of casting to have Glynis Barber still involved and have the older version of Avon. And I don't want to give too much away if you, if you haven't <laughs> listened to it, but to have Gareth there as well. And, you know, it's all beautifully done. Did you enjoy writing that one? It's probably the high point of my, if not my like seven association at Big Finish, but my Big Finish association, which is the last 20 years now. Mm-hmm. Um, it was just, everything came together. I loved getting the phone call from John to ask me to do it. Uh, quite daunted, but it, it kind of came together quite quickly. Um, inspired by a, almost a single line of dialogue in Cygnus Alpha. Yeah. Yeah. Inspired by a line of dialogue there. To, that actually was the the point where, yeah, and then a few episodes later, Project Avalon, and those two things really kind of gave the whole impetus for the rest of the story. And then realising there was a certain thing we could do in the second part by tampering with a kind of a location from the series. I don't want to spoil it for people that haven't heard it. Um, that, that worked in continuity. That kind of really gave uh, the impetus for part two. So, yeah, we found you know, these little spaces in there that we could, yeah, and it, it all seemed to come together and work for the characters as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is to, to the, the rest of the writers. Um, what's it like, sort of like, uh, bringing back old characters? I mean, other, I mean, we've had Avalon back, um, which is not just only in the 40th anniversary, but she's, she's carried on in some of the later ranges as well, uh, played by Olivia Poulet, is that right? Poulet. Yeah. Poulet, oh, I do, I, sorry. <laughs> uh, we've also had Tom Chadbun back as Del Grant and um, oh gosh uh, Sheila Ruskin was back as well yeah. yes so yeah. what, so what's it like you know essentially being able to use these yeah. old characters and also get the original people to come in and play them going back to my first big finish play which is Scimitar and um, Tom Chapman was in that as as uh, Grant, and I, I just thought he's got such a wonderful voice and mannerisms that it was very easy and very natural to write him into a Blake Seven episode. Um, and I thought that he did a tremendous job all the way through that series. And uh, th- there are no fault lines at all running through there for me. Um, and similarly, with Sheila Ruskin for Alice Wan, that, that that's a relatively s- small role as it turned out, but I, I think she did like, a beautiful turn in that, especially um, getting to do a death scene, which um, I just thought she brought an incredible amount to such a small amount of, of dialogue. Yeah, really, really pleased. Um, the, the, the one person who I would have loved to have seen back is the other actress who played the other alt- ultra who was the R. White's Lemonade um, lady, oh, wasn't yes. she? And also in um, Genesis of the Daleks. Harriet. Yes. 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 I think maybe the, the only guest character from the series I've worked with was Tom Chadman again. Um, it, it's the same as writing any of the, regu- the regulars. It's just you know brilliant to be writing a character that you, you know that you know about that you've seen on TV. Um, you know, a little bit nervous thinking that, that the actor's going to see the dialogue and how to perform it. Um, and it's, he did, I'd also ask Hugh Fraser as well, it's, it's the same with him and with some of the characters that Big Finish had brought in and made you know, huge parts of the Black Seven universe. I think it was Mark that um, introduced Gear Wanted, but it was, you know, it was great to, to go back to that character and, and bring him in. You know, it's always, it always feels like an honour. I mean, with Del Grant, the, Tom was supposed to only be in the Armageddon store. Um, he, he left at the end of part three. Um, but, but Tom and Paul Darrow together in studio, it just kind of worked and they, they gelled together. I just remember that day of the two of them recording part, it would have been part one. Um, and they were, just, they were just brilliant. And David Richardson came to... David says, we never do this. He came to me and Karen and said, could you write a, a scene for the end of part three? Um, 
that brings Dell Grant into the you know the Liberator crew because at that point we didn't know if we were going to get Stephen Pacey. I don't think at that point and David thought we need another character to almost fill that role and it and it works really well I think um, and me and Cav wrote for for Dell Grant again and we put him with Taron so it was the, it should have been called the two Dells but no. <laughs> Is it is it difficult to to especially when you're doing the full cast audios? Is it difficult to write for everyone to give them a real good slice of the action? I mean, you know, we can think back to many of the classic episodes where you've got um, one of the characters just literally operating the teleport for the whole episode. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it is difficult, but um, I mean, John oversees the series and and make sure that the characters are uh, equally represented across the episodes, which is which is more important than you know representing all of it in every episode. So that gives us an opportunity sometimes to to take out one character. Uh, I mean sometimes we even do reduced cast episodes where we're just concentrating on one or two. Um, so you know within the series format we we have the opportunity to do that and really explore one or two. So you know they don't all have to be full cast given you know, giving everybody the same amount to do. Yeah, I've got a lot of admiration for um, for the other writers be, uh, who do that because, by pure chance, I think all the episodes, the full cast episodes I've done, have had the full Liberated crew to deal with. And, and yes, it is really difficult to make sure everybody gets something worthwhile to do and say. You have got that at the back of your mind. But also, for me, because I haven't done any others, that seemed to be a natural position for Blake Seven to have everybody there. That's like was, was an automatic starting point for me. So I didn't have to think about just tailoring it for like two of the main characters, which, which would have been an, an entirely sort of different type of, of story and script, I think. But uh, yeah, I, I think it works really, really well. And I think John has overseen that so well across the, across the series where you get the occasional full cast, the, the full cast story, and then everybody gets a, a strong episode from themselves. And I think that's so important, and, and it, it's it's opened up the series so much. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, most of mine have been, yeah, actually all of them over the last few box sets have all been with the full cast. I could write flight deck, liberator flight deck dialogue all day long. John is lucky he's never had a 60-minute script of just flight deck dialogue there's a rhythm to it you know it just goes up and down like a roller coaster i could i could write that stuff all day i love it um but yeah sometimes it is a challenge to think at the end of one of my yeah my last one yeah um (laughs) where i was just trying to find places to cut away to because i had everybody together so i had to kind of split two characters kind of tarrant and daniel were over there and have so i had somewhere to cut to because otherwise you're just trying to share lines around so but no if i could just write like that dialogue in an entire script i'd be very happy with that <laughs> I think the, the fact that we had episodes where there were weren't full cast stories i mean that really was a budgetary necessity really that was sort of given to us but I think it w- it we're able to turn that into an advantage you know by so we're saying oh this is just going to be an episode with just Tarrant and Avon and it just allows you to sort of focus on them and their relationship and you know and obviously if I look at a season of 12 episodes three box sets I'll make sure everyone gets a sort of good every, every character got a good episode yeah in, the, in each season I would say um and it just allows you to go off and do things. I mean, it's not completely uh, unknown in the TV series. I mean, the, the, the city on the edge of the world is really just a villa episode, isn't it? I think the, the rest of them probably are in it, but they're hardly in it. Yeah. Um, so it's it's the same sort of approach, really. And John, not only are you like the the script editor, but you're directing them as well. So you've got a lot, a lot of pressure. How do you handle that pressure and and getting everybody into the studio and not necessarily at the same same day or even the same studio how have you coped with with that uh, logistical juggling act yes yeah, sometimes it could be difficult i was thinking about this the other week there was the weekend that we recorded the bulk of the anniversary story the way ahead uh we also had three days prior to that recording the end of uh, the crossfire set so i basically 
and five recording days uh, in two different studios, plus uh, recording Paul Darrow's dialogue separately in Wolverhampton. Um, you just have to be a bit organised, really, and sort of, you know, make sure you've got all the dates right. And in some ways, not splitting the jobs up, you know, being producer, script editor and director, it sounds like a lot, but they all, of course, overlap with each yeah. other and with each other. Um, and I'd be very sort of lucky that, you know, even on the CV, even though I was technically script editor, I mean, Steve and Trevor both looked after, to a great degree, or, or set up the, the seasons. You know, Steve set up a, a whole outline for uh, Crossfire, and as did Trevor for um, the Restoration, which was great, you know. So there was lots, there was plenty of dialogue and other opinions coming in. It's not like I was just saying, like, we're doing this, this, and this. You know, it's not, uh, I'm not dictating to people. Um, <laughs> well, hopefully I'm not. <laughs> well, <laughs> hopefully I'm receptive to other ideas. But uh, yeah, I mean, it all seemed to work quite well. And uh, it was a bit daunting at first, of course, like any new project, but we seem sort of got into the swing of it and, you know, very relaxed with a regular cast. And we just all sort of, knew what we were doing really and so it was quite fun and comfortable and there are there are two actors who've been brought in um as who are now main cast uh you've got yasmin bannerman as dana which i think is fantastic and wonderful casting i mean her portrayal i mean it is so spot on it's amazing absolutely wonderful and the amazing alistair Locke, who you know is is filling big mm. shoes as well yeah i mean i can't take the credit for either of those i mean they they were both um well certainly alistair was already or i can um zen mm -hmm. when i took over and he's brilliant and i'm very very happy for him uh, to carry on with it and there was already uh thoughts about kind of recasting dana um and Yasmin Bannerman was suggested to me. I think yeah, Yasmin's name was kind of connected to that for a while. I mean, the, yeah. I think the first inkling was, um, was when Cav was Cav Scott was producing, but Cav had interviewed Yasmin for a Doctor Who magazine 10th anniversary feature for the first series of Doctor Who coming back. Um, and I think Yasmin said to him in this interview, without even knowing that what Cav did outside doing this interview. She said, I was never really a Doctor Who fan, but Blake Seven was my thing, because there was this character called Dana who was, you know, there was a woman on screen who looked like me, who was kick-ass, and, and so Cav sort of was just had this moment of, oh, right. <laughs> and I think it kind of from that point onwards, I think it was such an obvious choice. And, and I think she emailed him later after the interview to, to stress about the Blake Seven thing <laughs> and how, how Dana was, a, you know, one of her hit heroines when she was, when she was younger. Mm. So I sort of inherited that. Uh, and I was very keen to do it because it really sort of fed into that, what I was mentioned earlier about trying to make this as authentic as possible. And that, I mean, I think Tom Chadman was great. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, we would have liked him to come back for at least one more episode, but he wasn't available to us. Um, so that was not going to happen anyway. But by having Dana back in the mix, we were able to completely recreate mm -hmm. the, the regular cast of season three, effectively. Um, so which to me made, made it sort of completely authentic, I think. Mm -hmm. John, has there ever been a moment where you've, you you sort of like because you grew up with Blake Seven. It was very much a show that you watched as, yes, as definitely. Being, yeah. being young. Yeah. Has, there, has there ever been a moment where you've gone, oh my god, that's so and so? Oh, they're saying that line. They just said down and safe. Have you ever basically have you ever had a fanboy moment in the studio? Yes, I suppose. So. Well, <laughs> after the studio, I, uh, I mean, I, I think. The most obvious things uh, to think about were when we, we did the Way Ahead recording, Matt Irvin came along with That's all the, the most pop. ridiculous weekend. <laughs> because we sensibly wanted people to pose for photographs, really, we just wanted to play with guns and things. But um, uh, and I remember there was one point where I was showing Yasmin how she had to hold the bracelet for yeah. a photograph. And I rushed into the green room and asked Jan and Steve, I said, how do you hold it? It's like this, isn't it? And they said, yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> And we had the guns, and we had the yak, and, and so that was really quite exciting. And you know, I got these are the original pots, and I was so thrilled yeah. to get uh, to have Yasmin able to pose for photographs yeah. as David uh, using the actual 
crops, um, which again helped the authenticity again. <laughs> and so we were able to put it under covers for the following ones, which which was great. But yeah, I mean, it is, it's terribly exciting. I mean, I knew Jacqueline Pierce very well and long before I was involved in Blake 7 for mm -hmm. Big Finish. So uh, I was already, you know, I, I'd already had my sort of fanboy moment with her many, many years before. And, you know, and then that sort of gets a little bit forgotten and she becomes more Jacqueline than Serval. Yeah. I mean. So, um, so yeah, but it was, it was, I was thrilled to do it. Yes, I mean, and it, it's great to, and it, you also, because you sort of instinctively know what's right uh, in terms of what the listener's going to enjoy and think, oh, that's, that's right, and mm -hmm. or they wouldn't do that, or they wouldn't do that sort of thing. You know, you just have a feel for what is Blake said. Yeah. And, and I mean, do, I, as do we all, I mean, we all grew up with it, and I'm sure we, mm -hmm. you know, everyone feels the same. My fanboy um, moments, The Way Ahead Weekend was incredible, but I think the one that stands out is one of the Liberator Chronicles where we had Michael Keating, Tom Chadburn, and David Warner in the same studio. Uh, yeah, that, that was yeah, that was that was quite a day. That was that one stand out. But then the way ahead, just the way ahead because I mean I was doing a lot of ferrying cast back and forth from studio to the hotel where some of them had been staying. Um, so, you know, so spending time with, you know, just that 20 minutes with Jacqueline in the car chatting away, you know, they're very special moments. Um, yeah, no, they're very happy memories of those. Trevor, have you, have you had a, a sort of fanboy moment at all? Well, uh, apart from actually hearing the words that I've written being spoken by the cast members, yeah, that, 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 I haven't, I never attended any of these studio recordings. Uh, we did try a few times. John and I, but it just never matched up with with my with my work or my availability. So, um, sadly, that didn't happen. But um, you, you know, I, I am a bit daunted about the, the prospect of that as well. That that sort of, as you say, that that fanboy moment because it, it's a strange line to cross. I think, um, and perhaps I was able to write more freely because I was only writing for the characters rather than people that I'd actually met, mm -hmm. perhaps. And, and Steve, have you, had a, have you experienced a, a sort of Blake 7 fanboy moment? Yeah, I think my, um, my biggest one was outside the studio because I only got to one recording and it so happened that at the moment I turned up, John was in the studio with all the guest stars from the episode. So I walked into the green room and the entire cast of Blake 7 turned to look at me. And it's, it's just a wow. Well, they're all wearing eye patches. We <laughs> <laughs> um, was about to run out of time, unfortunately. Can you believe it? Um, but I, I suppose, really, what what is the future for the range? Really, what what can is, is there a future for Blake Seven with Big Finish? There's definitely a future for Blake Seven and Big Finish. Obviously, we can't do Blake Seven. We can, we can no longer do what I was saying. It, it's impossible now to emulate the TV series mm -hmm. without Paul. Uh, and we certainly wouldn't want to recast him. Um, it just wouldn't work. No, I, no, no. Uh, and I don't think anyone would be very happy if we tried. So, but uh, the intention is to do more stories set in the Blake Seven universe, just not on the Liberator. Mm -hmm. So there will be opportunities for the surviving cast members to still appear, but in different ways. If well, that makes sense. well, in one of the other interviews that we've done, I, I interviewed um, Sally Nevet. So, yes. how about this for an idea? A spin off box set series, The Jenna Stannis Adventures. <laughs> well, we've, to some extent, that's what we've done. I mean, Steve, I think you wrote uh, The Further Adventures of, of Jenna. Uh, yeah, I wrote Jenna's story. Um, yeah, I'm, I did try to leave some space in there in case we ever came back to that era, you know, try to tell the story, but leave something open just in case. But at the time, it didn't seem like something we'd ever do, but yeah, maybe now, maybe now we need to go back and look at that and uh, explore those gaps. <laughs> well, it, it's great that um, there is a future for Blake Seven at Big Finish. It's, it's really, really great. Um, one of the other things that you, uh, some of you have been involved in recently, and I think we need to uh, say a huge thank you to her, and that's to Lily May Sharrett about doing the, the tweet-along. So can we just all yeah. say a big thank you to her? 
Thank you, Lou. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, loved, doing, loved doing that tweet for one the other week. It was great. Mm. Yeah, so, I, I, unfortunately, I missed that. I just couldn't schedule it right at all. So I was, I had to just close my mind to it and sing. <laughs> I didn't want to go on Twitch and start seeing it all going on. So I just had to like, no, don't look. <laughs> um, I've been asking every guest who's uh, contributed to uh, Sickness Alpha Down the Safe to nominate a charity of their choice. So I'm going to ask you, John, to uh, nominate a charity where people can make a small donation for watching this video. Oh, OK. I think I would choose Amnesty International. OK, we will put a link up to Amnesty International um, uh, in the description of this video. So we've got literally a few minutes. So out of all the Blake Seven stories, which one should I go and listen to this evening? So let's start with John. Choose one. Oh, but I can't, this isn't bad. <laughs> I'm going to be lynched if I... I have to choose someone who's, who's written one who isn't, isn't here. Who isn't here, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. No, ask the others first. <laughs> okay, Mark, which one should I listen to this evening? I, I have to say the way ahead because of what it represents to for me to me as what Blake 7 is, I think. If it's not too gauge to rec recommend my own work. <laughs> Steve. <laughs> yeah, I was I was hoping someone else would go first and recommend their own work. I'll go, <laughs> I'll go with that. Um, well of my of mine, my favourite is Abandoned Ship. So if you want to if you want to hear one of mine then then go for that one. Trevor. Oh uh, uh, personally I Diplomatically, say any, any or all of them start at the beginning. <laughs> That's a really good answer, Trevor. Yes, any or all of them. <laughs> Actually, to, to avoid upsetting, I'm going to say, uh, I think it's Warship, it's called, isn't it? The first oh, one. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I really think that's brilliant because, again, it's uh, I keep going on about this authenticity thing, but the fact that I think he was so cleverly inserted it between the end of uh, season two and the beginning of season three. I mean, it just feels like a missing episode, which is mm -hmm. brilliant. And it's, it's a great place to start, I think. If you want to start anywhere with Blake Seven at Big Finish, yeah, I think yeah. that was it. Even to the point where you can imagine the scenes that were done at, at, at Ealing and what was on location and what was on at TV Centre on a Friday night, I think it's very <laughs> clever. Yeah. Needless to say, the only <laughs> written by my three friends here are brilliant, uh, which is, of course, why I keep coming back to them again and again because they are very good at what they do. Thank well, you. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you for your time. And yeah. uh, I hope you're all managing to stay safe during this time and, and busy. Um, but thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.